Good everyone. Well, this is another uh, GGR question and answer session. I thought the questions might have been getting less, but as we move into a, a new zone and a new activity, uh, it looks like we've got a whole different level of questions. So I'll try and get through all this. The, the week has been quite interesting. Um, uh, one of the surprises, well, maybe, was that Francesco uh, had a catastrophic failure of his wind vane, same as Philippe Pesch and same as um, Nabil. Um, that was unfortunate for him and now he's uh, headed, uh, in fact we just heard in the last few hours that he is actually headed to the coast of Brazil somewhere, we're not sure where yet, um, but he's not going to go for Cape Town. Um, so that'll be the end of the plan for now because there's not a lot of support over that side to get another wind vane and so on. So we'll look forward to uh, hearing from Francesco in the future what he's up to, whether he's going to come back for 22, uh, whatever. Fantastic effort, great guy. Um, um, it's kind of unfortunate, but that's how it goes. So uh, we wish him well, and uh, he's got reasonable weather to head over that side of the world as well. Um, Antoine is just arriving in, um, in Rio as we speak. Um, so uh, that's a great job for him to get there. Again, um, sad to lose another entrant in the GGR, but that's the nature of what it is. You know, the, the Atlantic legs really sort out um, those that aren't quite up for it. And Antoine himself made the decision based on the fact that he wasn't really happy with the way he'd prepared the boat, the way he'd set some things up. Um, he had some slight health issues as well, and he didn't feel confident taking it on the Southern Ocean. And, and that's a hard call, and, and uh, I admire him for that fact. You know, at least he's not carrying on and do something stupid. So, um, so um, it'll be uh, interesting to hear from Antoine later on, you know, when he settles down and, and gets organised. Um, pretty much everything else is happening. I did the weather review and everything. Um, Susie's the sad story. I reckon that whole decision of, um, uh, you know, not going south when she could have with some of the other guys um, has probably cost her 800, 900 miles in the race and uh, she's got to live with that now. Uh, but if you look at Istvan, he's been barreling down from the back so you never know. So, you know, just watch this space. Don't give up on Susie. Uh, we get a lot of, I've had various emails from people saying, oh, is she okay? She's lost so much ground and it's going so slow and all that sort of stuff. It's just how tricky it can be, you know, one simple decision and you can sometimes win from that, sometimes lose. So uh, um, that's kind of unfortunate. Anyway, the good news is if you saw that report, this morning looks like the next week is going to be reasonably settled interesting tactics at the at the middle of the fleet lots of holes there with no wind uh, but generally it should be smooth sailing touch wood I hope it all works um, the other thing I'd say before I get in the questions is that um, we are bombarded literally by people sending us emails sending us messages all that sort of stuff saying wow this is fantastic you know i've fought all around the world races but i've never felt so involved as you have been with this race and you know you guys are doing a great job and da da da, da. so thank you very much for all the compliments you know for me and the team and all that sort of stuff and um, we've even had a couple of people uh wanting to send us money <laughs> right and uh, i just got some mail in the cash i mean some cash in the mail I, we got a really cool card from a, a lady in falmouth um, I'll just read it to you. Um, it's from Yvonne, and it says, uh, dear, dear Don and the, and the amazing team at, of GGR, thank you for your wonderful race coverage. Uh, you have brought an amazing adventure to life with, uh, with humour, care, and professionalism. I feel so lucky to be able to share the ups and downs with you and all, especially all the, all the uh, competitors. Well done and thank you. And she sent us 50 euro. <laughs> now, why am I saying all this? Well, basically, um, the 50 euro goes straight to Citran. And Citran is our designated charity. And it's all about these bears. This is the Citran uh, teddy bear in terms of our frontline uh, uh, flagship, you might say, for the race. What's Citran? Citran is a world center of excellence for research into motor neuro disease and also with spin off to uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We're all getting old. I'm getting old. Look younger with my groovy French glasses, I should say. Um, but um, it's a serious issue. And certainly MND um, has very low levels of government support around the world for funding for research. It's a horrible condition to have, you know. Um, I won't go into all that now, but certainly I've been a supporter of uh, Citran for probably uh, eight years now. And if you think we're doing a good job and you want to sort of say good day or say thanks or whatever it is, maybe uh, just head to the to the uh, um, the Citran uh, giving page. We, you know, GGR has a, a just giving page where you can make a donation. You could make a one pound donation, similar price of a cup of coffee or whatever, and that helps a really good cause. Because remember, Jean Luc's not a young fella. You know, he's about seventy three, fit and healthy. We're all getting old. You know, my parent, my my mum went down with dementia, uh, all those sorts of things. So so uh, yeah, just a little 
little snippets. So that's, and these bears, there's one on every entrance boat. They get, they're going around the world, having an incredible adventure. They've all been named by the skippers and they will all go to a new home at the end of the race. So you'll have a chance to bid on these bears and a few other things as well. So, so stand by for that. Anyway, uh, moving right along. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Yvonne, for your uh, kind thoughts from uh, Falmouth. A bit of fun. Okay, so the first question we had was... Um, uh, from Ted Heinroth, he's given us a couple of things here. Um, how do the entrants cut their hair? A pair of scissors, maybe. <laughs> That's pretty straightforward. What do they do with their garbage? They keep it all on board. Nothing goes over the side. Uh, they've got a garbage management plan. We've been through that before. Um, uh, in the first edition of the GGR in 50 years ago, there were wood boats, there were multi-hulls, there were all sorts of different other, other boats there. Why not this time? And that comes down to the nature of what this challenge is. You know, we're trying to make it more of an event. So all starting from the one time and uh, we're trying to keep the boat similar because we're celebrating the, the uh, amazing achievement of Sir Robin Ox Johnson in Suhaley, so it's there. But there isn't another event that's happening right now called the Long Route and that's very similar to the first edition. You can have any sort of boat, you can have any start any, any time you want, from different spots so um, so we're a little bit different but um, certainly the the uh, concept matches uh, our expectations and our our dreams for an event like this to recreate the feel and the spirit of the original Golden Globe um, and what's the next one was uh, what's the mental uh, and physical preparations for an event like the GGR it's in and that's really tricky to answer because every entrant would do their own level at that a lot of them did nothing about mental preparation and there's nothing wrong with that. Physical preparation, I think they all, most of them did some sort of activity, even preparing their boats and getting here and all that. It builds up their physical sort of prowess and, and uh, ability. Uh, Jean-Luc was interesting. He had some issues with his foot and a few other things and his knee, um, the young fellow that he is. But he, he watched that carefully over the year or so leading into the race and he set off in really good condition. And, and sailing the boats isn't as physical as you might think because you're trapped in one spot. In, in a lot of your upper body work, it, it is physical. Um, so there's different levels and I can't answer for all the entrants on their physical, their mental preparation. Um, I know for me personally, when I went into the BOC a long time ago, I didn't really do anything. It's just who you are. It's who you are, what you are. You just go and do it, you know, and if you're there for the right reasons, you are passionate about what you're going to do as well. And you will go through anything to achieve that. And that's where the mind game of the GGR comes in. And, and I've always said those that haven't got it up here and aren't really there to go, you'll find a reason to retire. So, um, so that's um, part of that as well. Uh, Jesse Mowbray asked about rainwater. This is a classic. Wanted to know, uh, is the rainwater filtered? Uh, and if, it's, if it is, do you then boil it or whatever it is? And I've got to say, any rainwater they get on board will be perfectly pure rainwater, okay? And so there's no filtering. It's good, good water. Some of the entrants have got issues once it goes into their tank. Uh, Istvan's got a problem. He's got to filter his water for particles that are floating around in the tank but that's uh, from the motion of the boat shook up and he didn't clean the tanks as, as well as he thought before he left um, this was a classic question from chris has uh, do the race rules allow for the carrying of a pet on board now as long as she's not cute and sort of you know um, a normal human being no you can't take her and you, but you can take uh, or whoever uh, uh, if it's not human you can have a pet on board. I mean, it's not in the race that you can't, but I can't think of any pet that would want to go. We did have a guy at one point that wanted to take a cat. He didn't enter the race. Um, it would be up to the entrant, you know. You, you, it's one of those things where uh, if they wanted to, I probably wouldn't say no. Um, bit of a strange one, but there you go. Um, okay, so uh, Bridget Peacock, the ability to self-write once the mast is gone, it probably came up from a, a comment I made when Ari, he's lost his rig and the boat is really violent. Now, when you've got a boat in the water with a keel down the bottom and the mast is up there, that mast is like a shock absorber. You can't, the boat can't move too fast because it's got to move the whole physical um, weight of that mast and it's like a buffer. It, it creates a softer motion. Once you take the mast off, so you've now got the boat and the keel. The motion is really violent. You get chucked around because the waves hit the boat and there's nothing, the boat just gets flicked. And certainly Ari thought he might have got rolled over again during that first night, he didn't. Um, so what's the ability? Normally you'd say it's harder to roll over without the mast, but the motion in the boat would be really horrific. It's, it's just getting flicked around because you, you don't have that, that softener of the, the mast sticking up there. Um, Dorian Prest, uh, P 
Petrizo, uh, what are the, what uh, what happens? Um, um, oh, I wanted to know about Ari. What actually happened, and and all the things that that went on. Now, um, Ari is the quintessential seaman, and and uh, you know a really good performance sailor. He's been around for a long time. Um, we're all interested in this question. I'm not going to attempt to answer it. I'm absolutely certain that when when he gets to Cape Town and he settles down and, and says good day to the family and friends and stuff, he will give us some great stories about what happened. When I say great stories, I mean detailed reports and analysis sort of thing of of what happened the reason he chose to hove to what the sea state was like and so on so um, let's leave it to Ari um, stay tuned for that one um, Robert Miller wanted to know about jury rig details what and how well the first thing I'd do is look at some of the posts that we just put up about Ari there's pictures there of when he was when Ari was trialing his uh, twin spinnaker pole uh, jury rig which was a mandatory requirement for all entrants in the GGR um, to go out and work out a jury rig. Um, it's pretty simple, it's just a bipole, two spinnaker poles into the court, into the gunnels of the boat, lash at the top, put a block there, and uh, it's all stretched out with ropes so it's secure. It's not that hard to set up because you can lay it down on the foredeck, put some ropes, pull the ropes up and it's set, you know what I mean? So it's up in the air. And then they usually raise an upside down storm jib or something at the front, part of a mainsail or something at the back, and uh, you're not going to win the America's Cup, but it, it, it's it's up there and you can you know get underway again. Um, so and if they didn't have to use the spinnaker poles, they could use whatever they want. Sometimes you can salvage your boom if you lose your mast. And the other thing, of course, is that uh, classic, typical Mark Slats performance guy doesn't want to go slow he wants to get around he's uh, uh, and his manager they they made a sleeve so instead of having a bipole rig with the spinnaker pole two like that they put one pole on top of the other they can join them together so you've now got like about 12 meters of new mass to put up there I think it's 12 uh, it'd be about uh, 20 feet yeah yeah maybe whatever but they put two masts together with a little spreader base in the middle and uh, rig that up and that gives you a lot more height a lot more sail area and you can perform a little bit better at the end of the day uh, even though they've got all this good gear if something if they broke a spinnaker pole you would use whatever you've got to get some sort of sail up and keep moving so uh, we also required all the entrants to have um, a whole complete second rudder system steering system not just a spare tiller but a steering system um, and that's part of the mandatory requirement as well in case they drop their rudder or something catastrophic happens to their steering um, okay jan anderson um, strategy for enough sleep what are the entrants doing this is a very personal thing again all the entrants would be um, doing something different but similar the first thing is you know when your body's getting tired. It's very easy as a sailor when you are out there to forget you've got to recharge your own batteries, especially for short time stuff, and you can get incredibly tired. The best sleep management you've got, whatever's happening, as soon as your body tells you you need sleep, you've got to get it and get it in the bank. And remember this, if you, let's say uh, if you're getting tired, you're going below the line. If you go below the line to about here, you can get some sleep and catch up pretty easily, right? And then you carry on and then you get a bit tired again. You go, oh, you get catch up, you know, get a bit catch up. If you go below the line and below the line and below the line, and then you get a little bit of sleep, you only catch up a little bit. And it's harder to recover if you let yourself go way down. So short bursts of sleep are really important. It might seem hard for you to believe, but normally when you go to sleep, you, you'll get six, seven hours, eight hours sleep. Um, but and and if if you're during the daytime, you want to get down. And I just want to have like an hour sleep. And go boom. Some people can't do that. When you're on a boat sailing, you can very easily say, oh, nothing's happening right, I'm gonna go down for half an hour and have a half hour sleep, or I have an hour sleep. You get into this routine, it's easy to do. Um, the worst times for sleep is in the doldrums when there's no wind. Um, it's very hard to, to um, get that sort of break because the boat is talking to you all the time. You can be asleep, and when something happens on the boat, it will wake you up. You know that the motion's changed or the sound's changed. You just automatically wake up. You're very attuned to your boat. So uh, that's the worst time. So. So uh, I, don't, I didn't hear anyone talking about doing sleep deprivation training before the start of the race, which is what a lot of the performance sailors do in the Vendée Globe and you know, the long you know, transatlantic races, the top level athletes, they'll do all that. 
I don't think of any any of our guys did that. Um, they'll just manage it themselves in the most simple way. When they get tired, they try to get sleep. If they can't, they've got to stay up and they're mindful of that and they'll get down again as quick as they can. Um, the fascinating subject is the different ways they wake up with various clock timers and all that sort of thing. So um, um, so I hope that explains a little, little bit about that. Um, okay, Rob Havel. Uh, is Sir Robin Knox Johnson keeping up with the GGR and what's his thoughts? Well, I can certainly tell you he's he's uh, watching the GGR very closely. Okay, um, you know I wouldn't say every day, but it, it'll probably go close to every day. Um, when and we get messages and stuff. Uh, when uh, uh, when Ari lost his rig, uh, Sir Robin knows Ari. He knows all the entrants quite well, and and he was as shattered as, as we were. He couldn't believe it. He sent us a message straight away and said, "Wow, how disappointing is that?" Um, you know, well prepared boat well-prepared sailor, you know, skilled sailor, excellent seaman, um, a rig that was as solid as a rock, and he lost it, you know. Uh, we'll talk, this will be a subject for a while because there's a lot to be learned in that, and that's the nature of what the race is. So, so yes, he is uh, really following the race closely, and uh, what's his thoughts? I'm not him. Uh, <laughs> I, I won't uh, uh, try and suggest it, but what I will say is that, and I think everyone knows this, he is a great friend of the GDR right from the very beginning. He understands what we're trying to achieve, and I think he feels like I do that that it's happening it's real and it's achieving everything we ever set out to do not only for the entrance but also for us that are watching and remember I'm a spectator too you know uh, we're close to this but we're really enjoying the ride it's it's a bit of work and and so on but we uh, um, we're part of that and so I'm quite certain that his thoughts are this is cool you know he's enjoying it <laughs> and uh, uh, we go from there and I should also say there's an interesting one there we we don't go on but I noticed um, Simon came up and did some posts there or some comments just recently um, someone saw that we had a picture of Donald Crowhurst up in uh, in the office uh, which you know we've got lots of pictures there um, you know we respect uh, Donald Crowhurst a lot um, in, in the nature of the race and and I will say and keep an eye out for the book later on there's some elements of that whole Donald Crowhurst issue in this race, in the GGR right now. And I'll go through all that at the end of the, the race, I think. But uh, suffice to say, uh, the Crowhurst family are watching the GGR as well. And uh, anyone that's been involved with the original race is fascinated on what's going on now. So uh, uh, interesting situation. Uh, David Sketchy, um, uh, the rig, uh, Reef just okay. Jean-Luc, he really fa this, um, David is fascinated by what did Jean-Luc do? Jean-Luc is a leader of the race, an incredibly experienced sailor, a really young guy, <laughs> fit and healthy, um, and he's got a wealth of experience. So right, it's, it's you know, the right thing to do. Look at his boat, what's he done? I can tell you exactly what he's done, as quickly as I can. First of all, he uh, has got a well-engineered strong rig, but he decreased the height because he worked out that he'd be reefed most of the time, he'd never get to full hoist. And that was the case. In fact, Mark Slats has said he's never, hardly ever gets full hoist. He's always over, if he does, he's over canvas. He's got a traditional cutter rig, uh, Russell 36. Um, I just spoke to his, you know, his wife is a good friend, Deal. I spoke to her again, we had dinner last night, and she went through the process of how long it took Jean-Luc to make the decision on furling gear. He was at it for months weighing up the pros and cons and this that, and that because there's a lot of weight on the rig when he's shortened the rig to save weight and in the end he concluded there is no question he has to go with two furling gears one on the outer and one on the staysail so he can roll sails up and down right he can do the same with his uh, staysail roll it in and out you know how many sails john luke's taking he could take up to 11 sails on the boat he's taking seven sails that includes spinnakers and all the rest of it he's got the least number of sails on the boat in anywhere in the race. Um, he knows his sails really well. He's worked with a sail maker a lot. He knows how they're gonna perform in the Southern Ocean and they're really tough and, and he'll look after them and so on. But it's some really interesting stuff there. What's he do with mainsail reefing? He's got slab reefing, he's got three. They're deep reefs, he's only got one mainsail and all of the reefing is done from the cockpit. So he doesn't even have to go forward. He can reef his mainsail from the cockpit. Um, so everything is about saving energy. Right? And uh, you know, we've, I've discussed this with Jean Luc heaps as well. Um, you go onto the uh, onto the foredeck to change a sail on Hanks. 
You can slip, you can injure yourself, you're cold, wet, miserable. You go forward to the mast to uh, put a reef in the in the main. Um, you've had to gear up. You've had to get clipped on. You've had to do everything. Walk forward. Stand there. Waves hitting you. Trying to pull the reefs down. All that sort of stuff. Why? You just run ropes. So you have a, a, a luff line um, pulling the luff down at each reef point. You have a leech line pulling the reef down at the at the back of the boat. It is entirely possible to reef running downwind, a, main, a mainsail running downwind with slab reefing from the cockpit. So don't believe everything you read. You do it in stages, okay? And to me, it's incredibly sensible. So, so Jean-Luc, watch this space. So far, so good. He's got a long way to go, but his boat is worth looking at. And um, he's got some very sensible things born out from five previous circumnavigations. Um, a lot of time, other times he didn't make it, so there's still a lot more time in the Southern Ocean. And he just knows. And so he's a prof guy that wants to win the race, he knows he's got to finish the race. He's got a fantastic boat. And uh, this is bringing back that whole thing about shorthanded sailing, developing stuff for cruising boats. Why would you look anywhere else, you know? Um, the equipment's around. There's not a lot of new equipment, maybe. Um, but the way you use that equipment and what you decide to use is right there in front of you in the GGR. And some comments I'm seeing coming through is, oh, yeah, but it's not. It, this gear's not meant for racing, you know? Well, you've got to remember that a lot of the time now in the, in the GGR, they're not really racing. They're just trying to sail well and get there, get to the finish. It's not America's Cup stuff. Um, certainly, they're putting demands on the equipment. But, um, you know, if I was a cruising sailor going out across an ocean with a family, I'd be really interested in this event. <laughs> so anyway, but that was an um, interesting question. Um, okay, Margaret Keys um, asking about the jury rig deck fittings. Uh, uh, you can, it's all about chafe when you set the jury rig up. So if you have a spinning a pole in the, in the gunnel over there and another one here with loads on it, if you had to sail for 3,000 miles with that, Ari's only doing 400 miles, but if it happens in the Southern Ocean a bit further on, you can't turn around. There's a lot of load there, so it'll be the poles will be pushing on deck. So entrance did different things uh, just to stop chafe. That's the main thing because um, there's little bits of movement. So each one's different, but but it's all about stopping chafe and making them secure. Um, Dem Edu, um, um, we uh, oh once the mast breaks, uh, three sixty sail on. Oh, I can't remember the question here. I can't remember my own writing. Um, uh, no, I'm not sure about that one. I might have to come back to that later. Okay, Sandy Rafferty, um, opinion for a circumnavigation solar boat. Um, oh, okay, this is an interesting one. I get asked this question often, not just now, but in the last 20 years. Um, the question goes like this, that in my opinion, my personal opinion, if I wanted to design and build a uh, solo circumnavigating yacht now, using modern technology and modern build techniques, would I choose carbon fiber or steel, right? And it's not for performance, I'm just after strength um, and after safety, not speed. And the, the short answer is, it's got nothing to do with what the boat's made of. It's got everything to do with the design of the boat and how you set it up, right? So I get this from cruising people. They say, oh, I'm gonna go cruising, I'm gonna go through the Pacific, and oh, I'm gonna get a steel boat, you know, because it's really strong, and when I go on that reef, I'm gonna survive, you know? It's, it's completely wrong, wrong attitude. Um, it's all about being sailing on the ocean, you know? So, so the first priority is to have a good designed, a well-designed boat. Now that opens another can of worms and, and it's too hard to answer here in a short question, but, but it's not the steel or the carbon fiber. Um, both mediums are fantastic. You can have a great steel boat, you can have a great carbon fiber boat. There's budget issues there as well, um, but I'm just relating it specifically to this question. It all comes down to design, not what the material's made of. And it's the way you use that material. You can build a bad steel boat if you don't get the, desi get the design and structure right. You can build a bad carbon fiber boat. Remember the America's Cup with the Australian, Australian boat? It just <laughs> folded in half and sunk. Um, so remember, it's the design of the boat, the human dynamics of it, how you can work it and live in it and all that sort of stuff, rather than the build materials. And what would I use? Depends on my budget. You could do it. I mean, I've, my first boat was a um, a replica of Suhaili, right? Uh, I started building it when I was 18. It was made of concrete, <laughs> right? Concrete was a ferro cement boat. And there's nothing at all wrong with ferro cement. I've got some friends, you might see them pop up, uh, Mike and Gay Lewis. Uh, they build their boat at exactly the same time. Yes, I was 18, so it's like 
long time ago, 35, 40 years more. Um, they've been cruising around the world a couple of times, around Cape Horn, all the oceans, concrete boat, they're still going, they're having a great time. So it's the design of the boat, how it's built and engineered and things like that. So uh, that's a bit of a long answer for a short question. Um, okay, um, Janice Deegan, uh, what's the choice between laying a hull and hove to? I think I might leave that one to, uh, you know, what's the best way to go until we talk here with Robin as well. Um, Robin will be here tomorrow afternoon and we're going to have another, uh, like, old, old fella's discussion about sailing and stuff uh, on various subjects. It'll be interesting to get another opinion, so stand by for that one tomorrow. Um, next one, um, uh, from uh, Sharon uh, Crocker. Uh, worked example of the jury rig with spinnaker poles. So, okay, so best thing is to look at the look at the pictures of Ari's boat. You'll see it there. I don't know why I doubled up on the question, but thanks anyway. Uh, Mike Phillips, I wanted to know what's the opinion of wind or water generators? Um, you know, because he's seen wind generators failing. Well, um, basically, again, uh, wind generators are fantastic. Water generators are fantastic. The 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 deal is everything's going to eventually break. It's whether you can fix it at sea, that's the big thing, um, and how you install it, and what's gonna happen to it at the time. Um, so, I'll give you, um, in fact, can you get me the picture of Jessica's boat? Um, I'll give you a couple examples here. Um, uh, the water generator, Susie's got one of the um, Watton Sea water generators, she's got problems with hers, propellers are broken, and uh, thank you. Uh, propellers are broken, uh, you know, can't w and others have hit things and they can't work out what they've hit because there's no damage on the front of it. You can take them out of the water and put them in again. Istvan and, uh, uh, Istvan and uh, Tapio have got a different style. It's bolted permanently on the back of the boat. Looks a bit awkward for me. They've, they're having problems with that as well. Um, nothing's easy, right? But there are lots of, you know, I wouldn't like to recommend or suggest what's good, bad, or indifferent. Best thing there, uh, go for Google, look at all the brands around and, and sort that out yourself. But water generators can give you a huge amount of power. They're quite handy. Wind generators, same deal. There's some phenomenal wind generators now. On my last boat, I've had some big, um, uh, you know, one, I just had a couple of wind generators, but uh, one in particular. Um, you could generate 20 amps. I couldn't use the power that the wind generator is putting out. Relatively low drag, but yes, they're vulnerable. When you hit the water with them on a knockdown, uh, you, uh, uh, you've got to try and repair it and so on. There's an interesting one here. This is a picture of Jessica Watson's um, uh, boat. Uh, she went around in SNS-34. She had a wind generator up, up here. It was a Rutland. We had an interesting conversations before she left. I was suggesting a different brand. And she says, no, no, I want to go with this one. But the thing was, she had a really good idea because I said, whatever you do, you've got to be able to get it down and replace the blades really easy. So she had a, um, a sh this is a mounting pole and there's a pivot there with another arm here. So if she ever blew this up, she can untie the lashing here and the whole thing just pivots down so that the wind generator is now on deck. She can take it off, take it below, work on it, put it back up again, and then just pivot the whole thing up again. I think that's a really clever idea. Um, I very very rarely see that copied. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, that's that's um, they're both right. It's just up to you where you mount it. In 22, I'll be going in a Joshua. I'm going to put a wind generator up on the mizzen mast and hope that I don't go down too hard and too fast to smash it in the water. It will probably happen, um, but I can climb the mizzen mast relatively easy, take it off, either repair it or if I want to, if everything else on board, the solar panels are working, I can take the wind generator down and not have it there and just bring it back online if I have a problem, if I need more power. And I think this is important for all forms of alternate energy. Um, your solar panels, your wind generator, even your water generator, you don't need them 24 hours a day for the whole 10 months or nine months or six months if you're Jean-Luc around in the GGR. You can take some of them and put them below, keep them safe. When you need them, bring them out, plug them in and use them. So uh, that's another tactic. Solar panels, everything, the whole lot. You can uh, have some spares there or whatever. So keep it working. Uh, Timothy Warren's uh, uh, water makers, were they allowed? No, but we have an emergency one in their panic bag, little 06, I've mentioned that before. Survivor 06, uh, an hour of pumping gives you 200 litres, uh, 200 millimetres, millilitres of water, like a small glass of water after an hour of going like that. Um, now, there is the good one. Question from the same guy, Warren, uh, Timothy, asking about, we allow the conversion from a deck step mast to a keel step mast and vice versa. If a boat's got a keel stepped, we let it go to deck step. It's a personal choice. Certainly when you go to a keel stepped mast, 
The mast is supported very well at the deck level when it goes, so it's bolted to the to the um, he, you know to the mast step at the bottom. It's then a, held rigidly at the deck, and that means even if there was no rigging and you're in the marina, the mast would sit there. Right? It gives a lot of initial support uh, for that column. You know, the column's not going to move to up to the next spreaders. So, yes, a keel step mast is a lot stronger than a, a deck step mast. But then what happens is you look in Susie. I forget. I forget whether Susie's deck step or keel step, but she's got a massive mast section, a big, um, a big massive rig. You know, all the rest of it. It's the way people interpret the extra strength. If you go keel step to there, they say, oh, that's cool, I'm stronger there, so I can afford to use a smaller mast section now. Or do you say, right, this is my mast section for a deck step mast because it's not supported as well. Why don't we use the same size section and take it right through the keel and make it doubly strong? So there's all sorts of interpretations on that. Either way, anything to do with safety, we allow as an upgrade. So uh, yeah, we allow all of those uh, conversions. Um, Robert Reynolds, I've nearly finished all this. Um, did we, uh, oh, in, in the case of Philippe Pesch, um, he broke his tiller. Um, did he have an emergency tiller? Well, yes, he sort of did, but he used the materials to, uh, that he would have normally used to repair his tiller quickly to try and repair his wind vane when it had previously broke. But then, of course, it had the catastrophic failure, but his bits were still connected to that, that broken wind vane. So he, he was short on bits to repair his, replace his tiller. But in the end, he did. He made a short tiller and so on. The next part of the question was, is it mandatory for all entrants to have an emergency tiller? No, it's not, because a tiller is just something that sticks out that, you know, moves the rudder. Um, and you can usually fashion something from something on board. I mean, when when uh, Sir Robin lost his, broke his tiller on Suhaley in 50 years ago, I think it was the winch handle, the anchor winch handle that he used. He lashed that with ropes to the, to the rudder head and uh, used that as a tiller for the next halfway around the well. Um, and uh, then are the other entrants carrying emergency tillers? No, uh, not necessarily. But they are carrying a complete emergency steering system. Um, okay, so that's that's really about it. I think that's a, a big session. Um, so thanks again for everything. Just like and share. Tell all your mates. Tell all your friends. Uh, the more people we've got following the race, the better. And uh, we'll look forward tomorrow to having a, an old bloke session on the on the on the bench here with Robin. So thanks a lot. <laughs>